on this expose. Foreign workers supporting U.S. troops in Iraq, some recruited under false pretenses, virtually captive. When a dozen of them are murdered in cold blood, one journalist wants to know why. Funding for Expose has been provided by Twelve Nepali men were kidnapped ten days ago by an extremist Islamic group Ansar al-Sunnah. And today all twelve were brutally murdered, shot in the back of the head or beheaded. These images only suggest... Late in the summer of 04, I was making dinner for my wife and myself, and she was on the couch uh, watching the BBC. She saw it on the news that these twelve Nepalese guys had been kidnapped in Iraq, and it was just kind of a little blip, you know, I mean... There had just been this endless parade of carnage in Iraq involving foreign workers. Because my wife is ethnically Nepalese, is part of the reason that we were paying attention to this case. Nepal has no troops in Iraq, but the murderers say the men were cooperating with the Americans. And Twelve guys from the middle of nowhere where there's probably no running water and, and there's no electricity and no nothing executed at the doorstep of the U.S. military, it just didn't make sense. In mid-2005, the war was intensifying, yet as a story, it was fighting its way onto page one. I mean, I saw the story on the 12 Nepalese. It was a story that we put in the paper, but it didn't, it didn't ring my chime, so to speak, editorially. And there was a lot of news fatigue going on where people would, you, you're trying to report it and you're trying to come up with original ways to tell stories, but the story really is the same day to day. People are getting killed. I came in and I, I immediately got on the phone with our Baghdad Bureau. The reality on the ground for reporters who are in Iraq full time is that it was just another story without any significance, without any kind of deeper meaning. I didn't learn why it didn't make sense to me until later when I started in my mind and through my research and my reporting putting together other pieces of the story. Well, Cam is encouraged to, to look for the story that the pack isn't following. So go off on your own. Do the story that I can't get from another newspaper. Early in his research into the murders of the 12 Nepalese men, Cam Simpson learned that military support jobs done by U.S. soldiers in previous wars were now done by civilians, most from poor foreign countries. The U.S. military filled these jobs through a contract with Kellogg, Brown and Root, KBR, a division of the giant oil services company, Halliburton. I found an interview with a Halliburton executive bragging about how little uh, they were costing taxpayers because they had all this dirt cheap labor from, from the third world. The new Merez Chow Hall is now the largest facility in northern Iraq. A key thing was to figure out that there was this massive privatization of military support operations that was happening in Iraq, which required 35,000 men, some women, from South and Southeast Asia for the most part. I was already aware of the fact that there was a huge human trafficking problem in the Middle East. And the U.S. government condemned these countries in the Middle East every year for human trafficking, mostly for forced and coerced labor. But before I convinced my editors to let me do the project, the only leap I had to make in my head was to figure out, wait a minute, the same pipeline that the U.S. government condemns every year, have we now tapped that pipeline to provide us with labor in one of the most dangerous places in the world? Well, who's paying these people? 
and and where's this money really coming from? And that's when we started kind of putting to some links together and tracing it back to taxpayers' money. And at this point, I've said, okay, let's do it. I was approached by the editors to do the story, but the hard part is doing stories that have already happened. How do you do such a story and be able to, to explain it, especially with, with photography? Can't blame people for wanting to move on to a better world. Ken did some, some, a lot of legwork before I got involved. He got a lot of good leads on these people, on the families and the, uh, the 12 men that died. But then we had to actually go on the ground and find them. I knew that if I could retrace what happened to these 12 men from start to finish, I probably had a pretty good chance of figuring out what that network was and how it worked. In May 2005, Cam Simpson and Jose Mori set off for Nepal. They began to piece together the story of one of the victims killed in Iraq. Vishnu Hari Tapa was an 18 year old kid, literally from the middle of nowhere in Nepal, from a little village called Sudabar in the foothills of the Himalayas, who um, was a sweet kid by all accounts, wore blue jeans, sandals, and so he took a path similar to many people in, in Nepal and other places like Nepal. He wanted to go and work overseas. One of the people that we found was his mother, Vishnu Mayatapa. She lived in this tiny little flat with her last surviving son named Krishna. To get there, you walk through these temples that are several hundred years old. You're in, in another world of another year. It's almost like you've thrown yourself back several hundred years. Tough lady. Cut stones for a living. If you have never seen that, it's a sight to see women cutting stones with a hammer. Their, their fingers are gnarled, bleeding. It was probably the most uh, emotional interview I've ever done. This was her firstborn son. And, you know, his whole reason for going overseas was to make a better life for his mother. And how did the idea come to the family about going to Jordan? It was just, I mean, the look on her face, I don't think I'll ever forget. Yeah. And there was a guy in his village named Kumar Tapa who had helped set up other people from his village in overseas jobs. He says you need to be in the capital in Kathmandu because that's where all these uh, labor brokers are based. Vishnu Hari Tapa would go through Kantapur daily every day looking for these advertisements. And he found this ad and he thought it sounded like a perfect opportunity. The advertisement was for jobs in posh hotels in Amman, Jordan, a country on Iraq's western border, outside the war zone. So Kumar Tapa took him to the agency, which was called Moonlight Consultants. And at the end of the interview, they told him, um, you passed, and you have to come back and pay us the 1200 bucks that we need to send you overseas, but it's a great job, and you're going to love it, and you're going to work in Amman, Jordan, at a five-star hotel, and it's going to be fantastic. And once that payment is made, the worker is trapped in that system because his family has either sold everything they had or borrowed or mortgaged everything they had to make that payment. This kind of de facto indentured servitude. Our number is 5917200. Amr Manhani knows a lot about what's going on in Iraq because he's been covering it for the Tribune. And you spent most of your time in Baghdad yeah. when you were covering for the Tribune. Uh, Having heard stories you... about the mistreatment of workers contracted by KBR in U.S. military camps in Iraq, 
Simpson enlisted the help of his colleague, Amr Madhani, who had been reporting from Camp Liberty in Baghdad. Cam had gotten an email uh, around that time from a very disgruntled uh, employee of KBR, which is a subsidiary of Halliburton. The source, he had access to a vehicle uh, and was able to take me to this place that was known as the Indian Camp. You're immediately struck by how many civilians it takes to, to keep this war going. There's all sorts of different skin colors. People, you see Filipinos, you see Indians, you see Pakistanis, you see Nepalis. And I was talking to people particularly about their struggles with passports. Uh, one of the things that happens for the, many of the third country nationals uh, when they arrive is that they have to give up their passports. And trying to get out of a country without a passport is virtually impossible. All residents. Camp was off limits to uh, journalists. Hello. Good evening. I was not supposed to be there. And I'd probably spent a few minutes too long. And the guards for these that were guarding the camp came into the container I was doing the interviews in and asked who I was. They were furious that I'd gone in to interview um, their workers and started by screaming at me. Um, they said that they were going to try to get the military police involved, but they first um, thought that maybe it'd be a good idea to take me out back and kick my ass. These people worked for Primed Project International, which was a subcontractor of uh, Kellogg, Brown and Root. Eventually they let me go. So you have the military, you have Halbert and KBR, you have 200 subcontractors, most of them based in the Middle East. They get their workers from what are known euphemistically in Iraq as body shops. And because of the way the system works, everyone is able to blame somebody else. I could find all the pieces in Nepal, I could find all the families, or at least a lot of them. The hard part was going to be the piece that I still didn't know about, and that was all of these brokers and subcontractors in the Middle East who were really fueling this whole system. After Nepal, Simpson continued to trace the path of Vishnu Haritapa and the other victims. He knew they were sent to Jordan, where they were met by a man called Iyad Mansour, whose company Morningstar had advertised the hotel jobs. I went to Jordan to find Iyad Mansour, who brought these 12 workers in and was quoted in, uh, I believe, an Associated Press or a Reuters story when they were executed saying he didn't really know what happened to him because he had passed them to somebody else who brought them to Iraq. He said, think of me as a middleman in a chain of production. The, the goods, in this case, are workers from South Asia. I, buy, I, I take the goods, right, and then I sell the goods which he literally did for 300 to $500 a head. And basically, he got them from Nepal, from a broker in Nepal. He sold them to this guy, Ali Al Nadi. He runs it's a company called Bisharat and Partners, which is a subcontractor to a KBR subcontractor. Ali Al Nadi absolutely did not want to see me. So I literally would have to go around knocking on doors uh, in Jordan and working the streets. <laughs> Eventually, I convinced his secretary to give me a cell phone number, and I started calling him on his cell phone. And I think once it became clear to him that I was not going to leave Jordan until he came to see me and agreed to speak with me, that he finally relented. And he and his partner, Amin Mansour, came and met me uh, at a hotel in Jordan. As, as he was interviewing them, I, I sort of sat into, uh, in, in the restaurant a little bit far away from them while they were talking and smoking, chain-smoking, and drinking beer. These guys played cat and mouse with me. They would never admit their involvement, who would never even admit that they had a contract. But through my research and my reporting, basically I knew that this guy Ali Al Nadi put together the, the caravan without any security uh, and sent these guys into Iraq. At that point, in August of 2004, it was pretty much unthinkable for any contractor to be driven along the Amman to Baghdad highway into Iraq. Nobody was doing it. 
they violated the most basic rules of a convoy which is the front two cars with these twelve men got separated from everybody else they were stopped eventually outside of the base that they were headed to in iraq near the sunni triangle by men in iraqi security uniforms and they tell the drivers you gotta leave them here leave the workers here you can't go any closer to the base and the americans will come and pick them up anyone with a wit of sense any kind of professional security person who would have been involved would have said forget it no way these guys dropped them and they left and that was the end of them the army of Ansel Arsuna which kidnapped and ultimately executed these 12 men made a, made a movie of it for propaganda purposes the version at least that was released on the internet lasted about four and a half minutes Ansar al-Sunnah army also released the video to Arab satellite networks as a warning to those who would help the American war effort. In the video, the terrorists behead one Nepali man before shooting the other 11, each with a bullet to the back of the head. It appears that Bishnu Haritapa, wearing jeans and a long sleeve shirt, was the fifth to die. It's one of those things I wish I never saw and that I try to forget. Ali Nadi and Amin Mansour completely deny everything. But I finally got the Jordanian authorities to give me these records that showed that eight of these 12 men, that Amin Mansour had registered them as residents of his home. One of the last pieces of reporting that I did in this project was I confronted him at his home and his front door is right here in front of me, and there were literally 21 foam sleeping mats stacked up next to his front door, where clearly these workers had been sleeping. When he opened the door and he saw me standing there, he just, his eyes were, you know, were huge. And I told him I had a small problem, that he had lied to me. And I put the records in his lap, and he just kind of wide-eyed, paged through them. And then he got very upset, and he started screaming at us. This guy was so angry, uh, my fixer uh, said to me, he said, Simpson, I should have told you, uh, in Jordan, if you're on another man's property without his permission, he can kill you. Cam had called in and he'd, he had found, I think, the house where they, would, where, where they had originally stayed and the padlock on the door, those kind of vivid details, they call in and you're, you're, you know, it's the kind of thing that you say, great, that's good, that sounds like it's going to be a great story. Ultimately, I had amassed enough evidence um, of these guys' involvement, of probably their criminal negligence in, in the deaths of these workers and in, in how they treated them and what they were doing, that there was no denying it. And I had from court records in the United States stacks of copies of Halliburton's contracts with these companies, and I knew that the contracts just left it all in the lap of these subcontractors in the Middle East, you know. We tell you what you need to do, you just get it done. You get the workers there, nothing else matters. And that's how we get this huge chain that snakes past all oversight and all regulation and all legality and brings these workers to their deaths in Iraq. And that's what you live for as an investigative reporter, is to find those little pieces and, and frankly to find the bad guys. We had a fairly good idea of how these 12 people had come together and then uh, suffered this tragic fate. We had, a good, we had a good story that people would want to know about. I mean, this is their money, this is taxpayers' money, and it is going into a system of exploitation of people who are, you know, who only, whose only crime is that they want to go out and try to make enough money that they could send it back and support their families back in some godforsaken, poverty-stricken country. So I get back to D.C. with the idea that I'm going to sit down and, and start to write up everything that I have. When I was in Nepal and under all the stress, I started smoking again. As I was writing, I was just chain smoking under this beautiful tree next to the gate in my garden. So I ran an extension cord all the way from the house and I just literally, you know, buried my head in my computer. It's nerve-wracking and it's frustrating and you never stop thinking about how you're going to make all the pieces of the story come together and it never stops. I wrote it as one giant narrative 
and I called it the blob. And we get the copy in, and we've seen the pictures, we've seen what Jose has, and we began talking about, okay, where's this story working and where's it not working? It all has to make sense, and it all has to be perfect and accurate down to every word and completely unassailable. I mean, we're dealing with huge multinational corporation in this case and the U.S. government, and that's pressure. But the most pressure for me was, can I do the story justice, the justice that it deserves? Uh, we had gotten wind that our sister paper, the Los Angeles Times, is scheduling a story uh, on the very same subject, uh, and uh, we didn't want to get beat on that story, and so we kind of uh, went into overdrive. <laughs> I thought, well, I better go down to the paper. It's a Friday. I thought I better go down to the paper and make sure this thing's everything's okay. It was a really good story, and it was well told, and it was compelling. And a lot of people read it and were shocked by it and angry by it and felt like there should be change made. And the responses in Washington happened rather quickly. A friend of mine who lives in Chicago called me and said, John, you're leading this effort to abolish modern day slavery, human trafficking. Have you seen the story in the Chicago Tribune? Cam Simpson's article was a shock. I was dismayed by it, and I read it with great interest because I've been working on trafficking issues uh, for about 10 years. Uh, I think it was a piece of journalism, frankly, that actually led to profound um, reforms. I got on the phone to the Department of Defense, and I said, have you seen this story? Because the trafficking victims end up in Iraq, and it was intended that they would eventually work for an American contractor. Going into the war with Iraq, we had a, a law, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which I wrote, I was the prime sponsor of it, that made it absolutely clear that in no way, shape, or form in the United States government uh, countenance trafficking. We will prosecute the traffickers and protect the victims. Congressman Chris Smith held hearings investigating the U.S. role in human trafficking as it related to supporting U.S. troops in Iraq. And good morning. The subcommittee uh, will hear expert testimony today concerning the scourge. Of Men died. And uh, so my concern with the hearings was to make sure this practice stops immediately. The story was about uh, Nepalese who were deceived in Nepal, thought they were going to get jobs in five-star hotels in Jordan. They were killed on the way to what was supposed to be their job. Force, fraud, or coercion. That is the definition of our trafficking law. And hopefully that wakes up the CEOs of, of the Halliburtons of this world uh, that we're not kidding. Trafficking is a crime against humanity. There's no question that something more could have been done. The laws were in place. They just weren't being enforced. Six months after Simpson's story ran in the Chicago Tribune, America's top commander in Iraq, General George Casey, issued sweeping orders governing the use of contracted labor in U.S. military installations. Well, General Casey then came out with some specific measures that they're going to require contractors to take to stop this, such as making sure employees uh, hold their own passports, such as making sure licensed recruiting agencies are involved, such as making sure there's no recruiting fees. These new uh, initiatives by General Casey, I think, are a clear step in the right direction. The key now is that they be faithfully carried out. I think the people who have moved on this have done so legitimately and definitely from wanting to do the right thing. I think they were shocked by what they found. I do know that living conditions have improved, and I do know that workers have gotten their passports back. Whether they can ultimately stop this huge informal pipeline that snakes past all regulation through all these different countries and into Iraq is a very difficult thing to know. We'll see what happens in the end.
funding for expose has been provided by